Fantastic, fantastic. We have your Bibles this morning. I want to encourage you to open them with me to the book of Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, we're going to be getting here just through a couple of verses this morning, beginning in verse 12 through verse 14 and looking at a verse towards the end of verse 16. And, and while you're turning there to Philippians chapter 1, I just want to encourage you to come and support Denise in this mission trip um, because I'm very proud of her for risking and stepping out in faith and obedience, you know, that, that is, we take these trips, we encourage others to take these trips, these are involved in all of our association, and the North Grand River Association, and a, team, a small team going and working with uh, women and men, mostly women will be Denise and the team we'll be working with, but so we need to encourage each other uh, to follow the Lord and risk for the Lord, and this is one way uh, in which we can do it, so I want to encourage you to, to be a great support in prayer and in other wise as led. Uh, this, for this for this trip, and know that there'll be other opportunities for you in the future. Just keep that on your calendar. It's coming. It's coming. Philippians chapter one, beginning in verse twelve. Uh, we're going to go all through ver- all read all the way through verse sixteen as we see something really uh, unique here in, in Philippians chapter one, uh, beginning here in, in verse twelve. He says, "I want you to know, brothers." that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that when it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ and most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word, word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, we do come to you this morning as we have already been in your presence. And we thank you, Lord, that we can be here again. And I just pray, Father, that in these few minutes, you help us to see your word here and what it is that you have for us and, and what it is that you desire from us. Uh, let us add, let me add nothing here that is not present in your text. Open our ears and hearts to you today. And ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. These, these verses propose something uh, kind of foreign to us. And what's foreign to us is the idea that suffering and hardships are good. Well, at least they can be. And that really is a foreign idea to us. We have a tendency uh, to press towards what is comfortable, what is easy, uh, what we can uh, prop our feet up on and flick the remote and watch and enjoy. We, We tend to avoid suffering and hardship. What Paul drives us to, what the Lord has for us through this passage, through these words, as he had him write it down and the way in which he did, is an understanding that God is doing more than the hardship that was happening to him. God was doing something much greater through him because of it. Within these verses, and the challenge here is Paul, the great, the persecutor now missionary for the gospel is imprisoned for Christ and he's enduring hardships for Christ and for the defense of the gospel the church in Philippi is struggling men and women who love him dearly and pray for him and care of him they are struggling to know that their their beloved Paul is in prison things are happening to to him. What do we make of this? What are we to do about this? How do we interpret what's happening to him? And Paul writes out to him a comfort and challenge and encouragement to have a kingdom perspective and what he's going through. To look at his predicament from the point of view of God. And so this morning, as we look at this text, there are four things, four encouragements that I want us to see from these verses as we trust God in our own times of hardship and our own time of trial, knowing that God allows and uses difficulties to shape you and to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first thing I want you to notice in this passage in your outline in your bulletin is this, that God is not absent. God is not absent. We have a tendency to think when we start going through difficulty and hardship and trial, uh, one of two things. 
The first thing is this, that, that God is not here. That God is absent from this difficulty. I'm going through this hardship. I'm going through this trial. And God is nowhere near to be found. On the other side of that, we also have a tendency to think that when I'm going through a hardship, when I'm going through a trial, that nothing good can come out of this. It's just a hardship. It's a difficulty. And I know that in our congregation, there are many of us right now who are going through unexplainable hardships. There are many of us right now who are in facing extreme difficulty. We have words of encouragement here from this text this morning. As Paul, as this church is concerned and worried about him. Somehow he has received word that they know he's in prison and they know he's enduring difficulty and they're worried about them and they're thinking these things. God must be absent from here and there's nothing good that can come out of this. But what does Paul write to them? He says, what has happened, passive, what has happened really has advanced the gospel. In other words, when the Philippian church saw his predicament as a problem, they saw what was happening to him because they could only see what was happening to him. They were full of grief and anxiety and worry. They were worried about what would happen to Paul. Their grief from the hardship that he and that they were enduring. They were anxious about the future and what it would hold both for him and for them. And when we face hardships and difficulties and trials, we experience those same feelings. But Paul wants them to know, he's writing to them from his imprisonment to say that this, there's more than happening to me here. What has happened to me, God is doing something through it. And when we come to our problems, we come to difficulties in life, and sometimes they come out of the blue, we need to keep that perspective that even in this, God can do something. Even through this hardship, God can do something. I want you to know here that Paul is the victim. He is the victim of being imprisoned for sharing Christ, for sharing Jesus. We would use it in our, in our 21st century terms that he is being religiously persecuted, that his freedoms are being trampled upon. But Paul did not see himself as a victim to the Romans. He saw himself as a victor because of Christ. And he says in verse 12, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What has happened is, is passive He's in prison, not from his own desire. He's there because someone else put him there. And even though in his imprisonment is happening to him, he does not see himself absent of God's presence. Look at the end of verse 16. He writes, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. We have these bookends. What has happened to me has advanced the gospel. You need to know that I have been placed here. I am on assignment by God in the confines of these walls and these chains for the defense, for the purpose of the gospel. He sees his imprisonment then not as something to get over, not as something which he is just the victim of, but he is the victor because he's under orders by God for the purpose and the kingdom of heaven. Paul had faith in the sovereignty of God that even in this event that has happened to him, God is not absent. God's sovereignty tells us that his people are in his place for his purposes and for his pleasures no matter where that place is. And because he knew God and his faithfulness, he was able to say that he was God's man in God's place in this hardship for God's purposes and for God's pleasure. There's a challenge here for all of us, an encouragement and a challenge that we must examine our hardships. We must look at the predicaments the problems that we find ourselves in 
and that we have sometimes been the victim of and look at it from God's point of view. What is not just God allowing to happen to me? But what is it that God wants to do through me even in this? Do I have a great problem or do I have a great God? Do I have a serious problem or do I have a God with a saving purpose? Does God only want me to be the victim or does he want to bring about a great eternal victory through this? Though the imprisonment was happening to him, God was doing something greater through him. Now, I don't want you to hear me dismiss this when we are the victim. There are some in our congregation who have been the victim of tremendous tragedies, tremendous things that they couldn't even imagine happen to them. So don't hear me minimize that because I don't want, that's not what I want to say. But I want to tell us all that when we find ourselves in places we never imagined we would be, God still has something to do through it. If we will listen and hearken to his voice, God's purposes are stronger than Paul's persecution. God gives us the victory to the victim in his purposes, no matter the hardship. Because Paul saw his predicament with kingdom purpose. He was God's man in God's place for God's purpose and God's pleasure. And God was not absent, but God is very active here. And I know that the predicament, the trial, the hardship that you are in today, the one that you don't even know is coming your way, that God can take what is happening and redeem it for a greater purpose. So it not, won't be something, it won't just be something happening to you, but it is something that God can go through you to his greater purposes. God was active. I want you to notice also here and be encouraged that the gospel advances. If you look here, the gospel advances. Uh, Paul here in our text, we see he was assigned to the imperial guard. He says in the, these verses, I want you to know that the, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. The imperial guard here is a, is a, a group made up of about 9,000 soldiers. These were the elite fighting men. They were hand-picked. They were offered double pay and had all sorts of benefits, including good pensions and special duties. Part of their special duties was to be uh, to guard the imperial prisoners, and they were often guarded, guarding him or guarding them rather by being attached to him by a chain. So imagine this with me, envision this with me, if you will. Here is Paul, who's in prison for Christ. He's been attached by a chain to a highly trained killing machine. And every few hours when they change the guard, the conversation goes something like this. Why are you here? I'm here because of Jesus Christ who saved my soul. He died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. And if you believe in him, you might have salvation and know eternal life as well. Why are you here? That's the conversation. And God is working through him by being chained to the imperial guard. Not only no this, but notice this. The gospel was advancing because he's sharing the gospel of Christ with these soldiers. And that message is being spread through the entire army. Into the heart of Roman political power is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just imagine those conversations. You ain't going to believe this guy. He says somebody died for my sin my, and then rose again from the grave. He's nuts. You got to meet him. And all these opportunities open because, because God had placed him there in that trial, was using him through that trial to advance the gospel message to hardened, battled soldiers and spreading that gospel into the heart of the political power. We know his witness was fruitful. We know it was fruitful. He closes the letter in chapter 4, verse 22, with this greeting. All the saints greet you. All the saints who are with him, those who called on Christ, greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. 
We know that God used him, used this trial, used this difficulty. It wasn't just happening to him. God used it, worked through him to take the gospel into the heart of the Roman political government. Now, do you have faith today that God could use you to take the gospel into the hardest reaches of our, of our county, of our city, of our country? He can. If we become his servants, and yield hardly to, wholeheartedly to him. Paul's response to his hardship advanced the gospel and how you and I as followers of Jesus respond to the hardship we are going through, the difficulty we're going through, the things that are happening to us. That will either point others to Christ or it will point them to your problem. I don't know about you, but I want people to see Christ when I'm going through trials. I want people to see Christ when I'm going through joy. I want people to see Christ in everything that I do, not my problems, but Christ conquering those problems. Suffering well for the sake of the kingdom is the difference between something happening to you and God doing something through you. We must suffer well, and that is not a popular thing to do, an easy thing to do. God used Paul in an amazing way to advance the gospel. God was ad active. The gospel was advancing. Notice else here as an encouragement to us that the church is encouraged. The church is encouraged. Again, he says here to, the, to them, he says, what I want you to know, these things have happened to me and the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment. Now, that, that sounds a little counterintuitive, doesn't it? How in the world would somebody be encouraged by the suffering I'm going through? I used to get in trouble as a kid when I laughed at my brother when something bad happened to him. You know, that's not what God is talking about here. He's saying, look, because of God's faithfulness, through Paul and through the church, the gospel is advancing. The brothers, the sisters is, are encouraged. Their confidence is in the Lord, not in themselves. They did not sit and say, well, if Paul can do that, I can do that. I mean, look at him. He's, he's a scrawny, ugly guy. If he can do that, I can do that. No, what they said is that, that I have confidence in the Lord to work. I have confidence in God to work. They're able to say this is what the Lord is doing through Paul. If the Lord can do something like that through him, through his hardship, through his trial, certainly he can do something through me. That was their confidence boost. God's actions in the past spur us on to trust him in his future in the future work that he's doing think with me if you will of the story of David who stood before Saul and Saul was ridiculing him for for boasting that he could kill Goliath and said you're too small to wear this this uh, armor his brothers were mocking him for coming out and saying you just want to see what's happening and and but David says, I have confidence in the Lord. David replied to him, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. God has done this in my past. He will act in my future. I will trust him in the middle of it. You think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing before the flaming fire. They speak to Nebuchadnezzar. We have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so that our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. When we trust what God has done in the past, we can trust that he is going to work in the future. So in the middle of the storm, we can stand knowing our confidence is in the Lord and what he is doing through us. The church was encouraged when God's people trusting God's past actions are faithful in the present for God's purposes and for God's pleasure encourages the church to remain faithful in their hardships. I love hearing our testimonies in our church. Men and women who say, God has done this. God has been so faithful here. 
He has been so faithful here. Because when we share how God has been faithful in our lives, it encourages others, men and women, boys and girls, to trust God to be faithful in theirs. We encourage each other. But lastly, notice here that the the church was emboldened. The church was emboldened. The brothers are emboldened. The sisters are emboldened. What I mean by the word emboldened is they were bold and courageous to share their faith. This is what, what the scripture tells us. And are much more bold to speak the word without fear. To speak the word without fear. Because the gospel was known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest, the church was encouraged and the church was emboldened. They trusted greatly in the Lord. I love Psalm 20 verse 7 that says this, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in everything we can touch and see and what we can do and our strength to do, but we're going to trust in the Lord. We're not going to allow fear to derail us. We're not going to allow fear to keep us from obedience. We're not going to allow fear to shape us and mold us and take us captive. We are going to trust in the Lord even when, especially when, we cannot see how he's at work. Because others saw his imprisonment was not happening to him, but that God was doing amazing things through him. The brothers, the sister, the whole of the church was emboldened. The gospel takes advances through adversity. Adversity cannot stop God's purposes. Hardship does not hinder the Lord's presence. And when God's people are surrendered to God's purposes, despite their predicament, amazing things of God happen. Maybe the reason that we don't see God moving, maybe the reason why we don't have the confidence to speak the word is not because we don't believe it, but because we're just afraid. We're just afraid. God, what happens if you actually do what you say you're going to do? What happens if I actually do share the gospel with my neighbor? What happens if I, if I do obey you in this thing that terrifies me? Will you really be faithful? Will you really, as your, as your spirit, as your word has said, allow your spirit to speak through me and use my tongue? Will you really do what you said you will do? And this church in Philippi and and us today are encouraged and are emboldened to speak the gospel because we're not afraid that God will keep his promises. We're not afraid that he will withhold himself. We're not afraid to follow and act and see that not only God is doing this, but he's working through it. In my hardship, my difficulty, my joy, God is working through it to advance the gospel. You can either, and I can either, leverage our lives for the kingdom of God, for the advancement of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, or we can flitter our way on lives on things that just don't matter. Jesus tells us in, in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't want you, I don't want myself to spend my life chasing stuff that's just going to rot away. I want to spend my life, I want you to spend your life, I want us as a church to spend every ounce of energy we have giving ourselves to stuff that really matters, giving ourselves to the kingdom of God, not to rust and things that destroy We come to trust the Lord, that he is at work. Then the predicament that we're in, that he is going to work through it. That the hardship that you find yourself in really can be used to advance the gospel. That through the problems that you are striving in right now, that God is at work in them and through them. And that will encourage and embolden us all to trust him more and more. 
I'm reminded of the story of Jim Elliott. And Jim Elliott, in, on January 28, uh, 1956, 28 year old Jim Elliott and four missionary partners and friends were martyred for sharing the gospel with the Haroni or the Akua people in the jungle of Ecuador. This was a small, unreached people group. Efforts had gone forth to make contact and connections, and they thought they had a good relationship with the tribe and through the people, yet they lost their lives on the morning of January 28, 1956. The account of their missionary work, including the previous contact, is just incredible. On October 28th, 1949, seven years earlier, so Jim Elliott would have been 21 at this time, penned this in his journal. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You can either leverage your hardship Leverage your life. Leverage the blessings that God has given you for the kingdom of God, for the advancement of the gospel, or you can flitter it away on things that don't matter. You may never find yourself in a situation like Elliot, but you will find yourself in a place and a time to advance the gospel to those who don't know it, to those who think they do know it. Holding a kingdom point of view a point of view that says this hardship, this difficulty is to me, but God is greater than even this. He can accomplish his purposes even through this. Having that perspective is the difference between the power of the gospel growing in your life and your problems being more powerful in your perception of God. Possessing that he is the, the assurance, holding fast to the promise and the truth that he is active even when, especially when it's hard to see how, he is active. I want you to know the gospel really has advanced, really has served to advance in my problem, in my predicament. When we encourage each other and see the word of God, the word of Christ going forth, we are emboldened. We are encouraged. We are able to lock arms together and say, I am terrified about what I'm about to do. I am terrified of the surgery I'm about to go through. I am terrified because the doctor says it's inoperable cancer. I'm terrified that what I want to happen will never. We are encouraged and emboldened to say God is active even in this and through this, yes, even this, the good news of Jesus Christ goes forward. Will you look at the problems, the predicaments, the hardships that you're in, from God's perspective, the kingdom point of view, or only from our own. You need to know the day that Jesus died for you. The Jesus that Jim Elliott went to share with those, with an unreached people group is the same Jesus that we proclaim this morning, that calling upon his name, and his name alone will deliver you from sin and give you eternal forgiveness and eternal life. So that you might see God work through you and be able to say tomorrow, days, years down the road, I was in this problem and yet God showed his faithfulness to me and I worked through me to bring about his goodness. God has brought you here today if you have not yet confessed Christ to confess him and call upon his name for salvation. If you're here this morning as a brother and sister in Jesus Christ and need encouragement, maybe during our time of invitation, you'd like someone to pray with you or to pray at these altars just to seek the Lord and what it is that he wants to do through this. 
I can't even imagine. I know some of the hardships you're going through. I can't even imagine how you might feel. I don't even want to impose how you should feel. But I know this, that God is greater than the problem. He can work through it. Maybe the Lord is bringing you here this morning to be a part of this church family, to be encouraged and emboldened by each other, to share Christ and how he is at work through us today. However God is moving as we sing our song of invitation for salvation, for prayer, encouragement, rededication, joining this church, I pray that you act with what he's doing. Would you stand with me as we pray and, and Rico comes and the team comes to lead us in song. Follow me.